Bridging canoe is a pretty straightforward process. First, make sure you've got good footing. And then instead of using your back, you want to be using your leg muscles, just like lifting any heavy object. Make a table out of your thighs, bring the canoe right up, reach for the far gunnel, and then one smooth movement, turn and bring it up on your shoulders. nice when you work for it. John Veeman soaking up the sounds of winter in Glacier National Park, Montana. Join me for a winter camping odyssey on snowshoes and make your own adventure on Trailside. Backpackers can be fanatical when it comes to their clothing and equipment. After all, everything they need ends up either being worn on them or ends up on their back. Knowing what to bring along and what you can safely leave at home comes from experience and a careful look at the trip you've planned. Hi, I'm John Veeman, picking up a few items before I start my backpacking trip in Tennessee's Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You know, an overriding concern for backpackers is finding clothing and equipment that's compact, lightweight, and if possible, does double duty. For example, you can shave pounds off your nightlight with a candle lantern, or even a headlamp. And this three-in-one eating utensil eliminates the need for a knife and a fork. You can even leave the kitchen stove at home with this modern backpacking alternative. But when you head to the Smokies, the big question is still the weather. It can be sun tanning hot one day and bone chilling cold the next. My answer is to prepare for both. Join us and find out if I'm right as we make our own adventure on Trailside. This is John Oliver's cabin at Cades Cove. Oliver was one of the first European settlers in this region, carving out a life in the wilderness in the early 1800s, long before the Smokies was a national park. The Cherokees named this place the Land of Blue Smoke, but the smoke is really a fine mist of vapor, a product of the dense forest and the heavy rains in one of the oldest mountain ranges on earth. The park itself has more than half a million acres with over 800 miles of trails. And on top of the Smokies are mysterious clearings the locals call balds. We'll be heading in that direction to one of those balds, Gregory's, a six-mile hike to one of the highest peaks in the mountains. But before starting out, it's a good idea to check in with a park ranger to see about local conditions. Hi, Jack. Hey, John, good to see you again. Welcome to Smokies. Oh, good to be here. Yeah. Well, we've got a great trip, I hope, planned, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. Where are you planning on going? Well, we were thinking of going right up to the Gregory Ridge Trail, up to Gregory Bald, which is a pretty nice high point around here. Well, that'd be a beautiful hike this time of year. Yeah, here it is on the map. Yeah, it's about uh, close to five miles up to the top on Gregory Ridge Trail. And the first part of it falls a little stream up to about Campsite 12. That's right here. Right yeah. there, yeah. And then once we get to the top, you're at Gregory Ball, which offers one of the prettiest views of uh, Cades Cove and the Smoky Mountains you can find anywhere. Well, with this fall color, that ought to be great. Yeah. Where are you planning on camping? 
Well, we we're thinking it's campsite 13. That'd be a real good choice. Uh, it's real close to the Gregory Bald, and it, uh, it's a real primitive campsite. Now, this is a relatively rugged trail, probably more rugged than most people think, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's all uphill. There's quite a bit of elevation gain, mm -hmm. and it's, it's deceptively rugged, rugged if you look at it from the bottom. It doesn't appear as, as rugged as it actually is. You mentioned the stream. Uh, do we have to treat our water, or is, can we drink it right out of the stream? Well, we recommend here that, uh, that you treat all your water before you drink it. Mm -hmm. Either boil it, treat it, or filter it. That, that's because of Giardia? Exactly. If you've, if you've got any type of filter that'll handle Giardia, then, then you're in good shape. Okay, I've got an activated carbon filter with me, so that should take care of that. That ought to do it. What about the bear activity this time of year? Are they pretty active? They're looking for food, right? Exactly, yeah. They're trying to fatten up uh, to go into hibernation, and uh, of course we recommend uh, that, that you adhere to the food storage standards that, uh, that we prescribe in our backcountry information. And as you know, it's, it's, it's hanging your food from a tree. Yeah, well, we've got plenty of nylon rope just to do that very thing. Great. Well, great. Well, thanks, Jack. Before we came here, we decided to take a stop at our local outfitters. The topic? Backpacks. Hi, Steve. What do you have for us? Hi, John. Here you head up to the Smoky Mountains. Oh, looking forward to it. It's been a while. I chose a couple of packs already. Wanted to go over some of the features, give you some options. Oh, great. I got an external frame. This is real good for heavy loads on a real hot day. Okay. Yeah, and this is with the frame outside the pack. Frame outside. Um, it's, got it's a little less nice expensive. Mm -hmm. than some of the internal frames. Um, not real good for a lot of scrambling. Do you think you'll be doing a lot of that? Yeah, I think we're going to be going off trail a little bit, a little bit of bouldering, rock hopping, maybe crossing a few streams. Okay, I'd recommend that, then going to an internal because it moves with your body a little bit more. That's right walk here. trail terrain. I've got this one loaded up for you already. You bet. About 30, 35 pounds in there. Yeah, that's about, you need about a mid-range size pack for, you mm -hmm. know, two, three-day trip out there. You have an adjustable suspension system on this bag. Now this is what's important, the distance between here and here, right? Right. You want to make sure that the center yoke goes right between your shoulder blades. Okay. Whether it's an adjustable system, this one's very easy to adjust, or some of them you've used a ladder system where they're sewn in place. Just make sure it's right between your shoulder blades. All right, let's okay. try it on. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Once you get it on your back, you want to start with a hip belt here. This should ride right on your hip bone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people do like to ride high, or if it's, you've been wearing a long time throughout the day, you'll adjust it as it's comfortable to you. Now you draw these straps here under your arms, down and back. Okay. Oh yeah, that brings it right okay. in. Now I don't cinch it in close to your body. The key then is over your shoulders, you've got two straps. Pull those in and you don't feel like you're going to fall over backwards. It really ships oh, yeah. that load. It brings the load right onto there. Mm -hmm. So you think about uh, evenly distribute the load between your hips and your shoulders? Fairly evenly, about 60, a little bit more down on the hip belt. Yeah. Okay. Um, the rest yeah. over on the shoulders. And we have a sternum strap. Sternum strap there, you use that to... This is a nice feature, what's this? That's a breathing system so that when you do have it cinched in tight, you still have the ability to get a good lung full of air when you're doing a lot of uphill scrambling. Okay. You use the sternum strap to just shift the load a little bit. Okay. okay. And then you have stabilizers here on the waist belt. You'll draw those in if you're doing a lot of fast scrambling. Okay. But leave them loose for now. Yeah, leave them loose and let, you know, because they take away from some of the effects on the top of the bag. Well, they sure are easy to adjust. You just grab yeah, them. It's and all pull. right there, right, you know, hands position. Let me check the fit back here. Okay, we're not quite against your back in the right, in the small of your back. Mm -hmm. Let me show you on this bag how I'll do a custom fit for you. Okay. okay. There's aluminum bars inside the bag. I pull them out and I'll actually shape this right to the contour of your back, the small of your back being down here, and this should be right at the bottom of your shoulder blades. So I can customize that for you for a better fit. Well, that'll be just like wearing a shirt, not just a pack. Yeah, it'll be much more comfortable for you. Well, we think we're all set. Steve, okay. thanks for your help. You're welcome. Now we're ready for the Smokies. It's usually a good idea to hike with a knowledgeable partner, especially if they know a few good stories. Today we're meeting up with Al Bettinger, who's hiked over 5,000 miles in these mountains. Al's an engineer and a member of the Great Smoky Mountains Conservation Association, which helped create the park in the 1920s. Hi, Al. How you doing? Fine. You all right, John? Good. Looks like we got a little bit of rain coming, but we ought to be able to beat it in a few hours. Yeah, at least it's not too hot today. Yeah. Well, let's hit the trail. All right. You got the water. Oh, yeah. I got the tent. Good. You brought some lunch. Yeah, I got a little bit of lunch. 
Not for me, anyway. Al, I understand you pretty much grew up in the park. Yes, I, uh, grandparents used to own a place here, and I'd spend a good bit of my summers with them, and oh. hiked and, and fished. And... How is it that, uh, I mean, it's a national park. How did, how did they own a uh, cabin inside a national park? Well, the, the 500,000 acres that comprised the national park was originally all privately owned. Mm -hmm. And when the park was being established, these tracts of land had to be purchased. And park Service gave the landowners two options, one of which was to buy the land outright and they would move at that time. And the other option was to give them a lifetime lease. And when that person died, then the property would automatically become owner, uh, would be owned by the Park Service. And then they'd just leave that property alone and let it revert to its natural state pretty right. much? Right, that's correct. We've got a lot of altitude to gain yet. Yeah, about 3,000 feet. Now, either big clouds just come over or we've started to lose our light. No, we're just under some rhododendron up here. A lot of that in the park. Yeah, it usually grows near bodies of water. Uh huh. You got different kinds? Is this a, a particular kind of rhododendron? No, this here? is either Catawba or white, or maybe some of both. Uh huh. It's long, leggy stuff. Uh huh. I hear some water down there, too. It's a Forage Creek. Is that going to follow us all the way up? Well, we'll be along that creek for about two miles. Well, there's quite a few forage creeks in the park, aren't there? Yes, forage creeks and mill creeks. Mm -hmm. Anywhere there was a mill, they called it the Creek Mill Creek. Anywhere there was a forage, they called it the Forage Creek. <laughs> it's kind of like... those names have been changed when the Park Service took over because it'd be kind of hard to map things. Uh -huh. All the same names. This is the white rhododendron here. That's Interesting plant. It's an evergreen. Mm -hmm. and as I was talking earlier, when the when it gets cold right around freezing, the leaves will curl up like an old hound's tongue. And when you see them like that, you know the temperature's at least below below freezing. Time to get out your long underwear about All that right, time. Right, you had already got them out. When you're in the Smokies, you're reminded about pacing. You got a lot of up and down, and you're going to have a long day. So I always like to set what I call an all-day pace, which is figure somewhere in between what you feel like doing when you're starting out and what you're going to feel like doing when you're finishing up for the day. About in between is where you want to sit. So keep in mind you're out here to have fun, not to win a horse race. Looks like we're getting into some bigger trees, Al. Yeah, that's a pretty good sized hemlock there, a poplar, tulip poplar on behind it a little bit there. I'd say the loggers didn't mess with that tree. Why do you think that one's still standing? Well, hemlock wasn't very uh, useful timber for the loggers. It didn't have any real commercial value, is what I've been told. Yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of big hemlocks that the loggers just bypassed. Well, we're gonna hit some bigger ones than that, aren't we? Yeah, on up the road there, there's uh, some virgin timber. Freeze it. Never have been logged. Can't wait. Well, check this out, Al. This looks like what something like what used to be a chestnut tree. Yes, John. That's the remains of an American chestnut tree. It used to be the dominant tree in this area. It's important for a food source for four-legged animals and humans, and good oh. tree for building houses out of lumber, logs, and whatnot. When this was growing, it must have been what eight feet across. Oh, five or six, anyway. Pretty rotten now. Look at look at this. Yeah, the blight back in the 20s and 30s killed them all off in this area. That's all that's left of it. This probably used to have a bear quite a bit of fruit, right? Quite a lot of chestnuts. That was an important food source for the animals in this area. Now, yeah, I've seen poplar trees, but I've never seen one this big. Yeah, that's a pretty good example of a virgin yellow poplar tree, John. Wow. This is a pocket of uh, virgin timber around here, virgin forest, that uh, we can thank Russell Gregory for back in mid-19th century, which is kind of a radical concept, but he asked that it not be logged so uh, can save that the trees for future generations to enjoy. No, oh, well that, that explains a lot. It explains why Gregory Bald is named Gregory Bald. That's right, it's from the Gregory family. Well, I hear there's quite a view up there. Why don't we get up there and take a look? Sounds good to me. All right. Al, you keep promising me there's some kind of payoff up here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm starting to 
become a disbeliever. Wait a minute. All right, we're clearing out here. Looks like we're coming up to Gregory Bald after all. Yeah, this is it, John. We made it. Oh, this is. This looks great. What do we have? Look at all these blueberry bushes up here. Yeah, too bad the blueberries aren't out now. Oh, but the color, color is something. Let's let's take a little side tour up here. Okay, yeah, we'll get a little bit better view maybe up here. Well, this is pretty interesting. Now we're at what 5,000 feet. Tree line here is 10,000 feet. Yet this whole top of this mountain is just about clear of any kind of trees or anything. Yeah, the grassy ball is interesting. The botanists and geologists have studied them for years, but nobody really knows why they're here. Cherokee Indians and the Indians before them talked about them, so they were here before the settlers came in. And nobody knows. No. Boy, but what a view you get when you get up here. Look at that. Now, what's that? That's where we started this morning down yes, there. Yes, that's Cades Cove, John. That's about six miles? Yes. Uh, and over here, we've got a whole other set of mountains. Well, that's Cleveland's Dome right over there, that high point. That's the highest, highest point in the, in the park. Uh-huh. North Carolina nice. side of the park's over here. Yeah, look, and these are all, this is all North Carolina down that's here. That's correct. Boy, amazing. It's going to probably one of the prettiest views in the whole park, I'd bet. It's a good one. And it's dropping, temperature's dropping fast up here. Yeah, a little windy. Let's put another layer of clothes on. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And then let's try to find, find our way to camp. It's not too far. It's a little bit down this way. Okay. This looks like uh, what the Park Service calls Campsite 13 now, but you had another name for it. Yeah, it's called Sheep Pen Gap also. Why yeah. do they call it that? On pre-park days, the Farmers around here would bring the cattle and sheep up in the high meadows, the grassy balls, and graze them during the summer, and then they'd gather them up in the fall, collect them, and take them back down the cove for the winter. Well, that sounds like what they do over in the Swiss Alps. Right. This looks like a pretty good spot right in here. Yeah, why, don't it's we, great. why don't we check this out for a tent site? We've got a lot of nice features here. We've got a nice, comfortable log here for a place to sit and have dinner. Good flat spot here. We got trees right up here for hanging our food, keep it away from the bears and other other critters. Get these rocks out of the way. This looks pretty good. Now Al's laying down, not because he's tired from a long day, but uh, while we're coming in looking for a tent site, well, we took off our packs so that that we're not getting impatient because we want to get the weight off our shoulders. You know, walk around, pick the best site, then actually go lay down on the ground and uh, see if that's, if that's how you want to orient your tent in terms of the, the pitch of the land. You obviously want your head on the high side so that your blood's not rushing to your head in the middle of the night. What do you think, Al? It's great, John. I come on, Al, wake up. Oh, I'm going to take a nap right yeah. the tent up. <laughs> well, not yet. Give me, a, give me a hand setting the tent All up. All right, this is a good spot. You've got the uh, poles, and I've got the, and you got the rain fly, and I've, right. I've got the uh, basic tent in here. Well, that pretty much sets the tent up. A couple points about sighting a tent. We know we're going to be having our heads at this end of the tent, so obviously that's where the door is going to be. It just happens to work out, too, that in this case the prevailing winds are coming from, from our feet, so we don't have to worry about weather getting blown right into the tent, especially if it's raining. Also, in the morning, we've got a nice break in the, in the tree canopy here, so we'll have a nice warm sunshine to kind of greet the day with come morning time. This tent in particular is a low impact camping tent and one of the things that's nice about it is that even with our stakes there's very minimal amount of disturbance of the soil as you stake out your tent. Well Al, you got that food just about ready to hang? Yeah, got the bag tied up here. Oh yeah, you've got it well rigged. Let me, let me give that a try. Used to be real good at this in high school. Good shot. All right. yeah, we'll hoist it up there and see how that works. Yeah, we got about a good 10 feet of clearance on either side. It'd be real hard for anything to get a hold of that. Yeah, it looks good to me. Well, let's bring her down. I'm getting kind of hungry for dinner. Annie Getchell prepares most of the meals for our trailside shows. And she's here today to share a few of her backcountry cooking secrets with us. Annie, can you really cook a pizza on the trail? You sure can. Any of your favorite foods will travel right along with you. Uh -huh. You want to make your food as exciting as the day you're having or as spectacular as the view. Oh, that's nice. 
Now, what's one of your favorite backcountry secrets? Well, it's no secret. It's mm -hmm. what you see here, diversity. Uh -huh. And beyond that is planning. Okay. Well, I'm at home getting ready for my Smokies trip. What should I be planning and what should I be doing? Well, make a list of your favorites and run down to the corner market and pick up a few things. Mm -hmm. Something like this. There you go. Um, but once you get home, you want to make sure to remove all your packaging because that takes up a lot of unnecessary space and weight oh, yeah. in your pack. Mm -hmm. For instance, these beans here, uh, uh, rather than take a can of beans, right. I bought some dried beans mm -hmm. and repackaged them in a smaller bag mm -hmm. and labeled them. Yeah, and you even said how much water you yeah, add to rehydrate. Yeah, put your cooking instructions with the food, with the bag, and right there, there you go. There's the rehydrated dried black beans. Hmm. And I'm doing the same thing over here with some dried strawberries. That okay. I, um, here's a pint of fresh strawberries. Mm -hmm. Here's a pint of dried strawberries, so you can see how much space you save. Oh, yeah. And here's some rehydrating strawberries. Mm -hmm. Now this almost looks like, is this salsa right here? That's rehydrated dried salsa. Mm. And I did that myself in the food dehydrator and right there's here. salsa leather right there. Amazing. So you just add water to this, huh? Yep. Just a little hot water. It takes about 10 minutes. Well, what other goodies do you have here? Well, I don't like to stick with the basics. You know, I like to try some exotic things and mm -hmm. um, right over here is some dried kiwi, which you can imagine on a winter trip, what a wonderful sweet that is. Yeah, good energy um, too. Some cherries, uh, nectarines, mm -hmm. uh, cranberries, and here's some uh, dried instant soup mix that I purchased at a natural food store mm -hmm. and I mix that in with my rice. It's real colorful now. Is the nutritional value the same? It's the same, and you'd be surprised that the texture is, is quite similar as well. Mm -hmm. Looks like you've got some popcorn over here. Yeah, and popcorn's some... a great trail food. And this is olive oil, I can tell, because you've got a label on it. Well, one time I fried some broccoli and some soap, <laughs> well, so I learned my lesson. lesson yeah. Yeah. It looks like, what, you've got something like yogurt here? Is that yeah, what I took a little hint from our Lapland friends, or mm -hmm. nomadic peoples who followed their herds, mm -hmm. and uh, they preserve their dairy products as kefir or yogurt, and mm -hmm. yogurt is sour milk, so why not take it along? It will last several days in its own little carton. And now this red... Red stuff here, is that bug juice or That's something? That's sun tea. Uh, that I brew, I throw in a couple of my favorite uh, herbal tea bags mm -hmm. and the uh, sun tea brews along uh, as I go on my backpack. Mm -hmm. And now I've got to ask, what's in this sock here? Looks well, like. um, it looks like a sock full of sprouts and that's what it is. Mm -hmm. These are radish sprouts, uh, radish seeds, and I throw them in the old nylon sock mm -hmm. and keep it moist and warm and in two days I'll have fresh salad, even in the Arctic. Okay, now what's in the spaceship over there? Well, I didn't know you wanted a pizza, <laughs> but I made you some cornbread. Oh, And this is right. a little uh, Outback oven that will uh, convert your regular camp stove into an oven, so you can make pizza or cornbread or cake. Mmm, well that sure looks tasty. Now what's down here? Looks like a tostada too? That's a tostada. Um, tortillas travel very well in the back country, mm -hmm. and there's some rehydrated black beans, mm -hmm. some cheese, uh, mm -hmm. some of my radish sprouts, and a little of my rehydrated salsa. Ooh, can't wait to dig into that. You mind if I go ahead? Go for it. A headlamp's a real handy gadget to have around the campsite. I like to use them for reading before I go to sleep at night, but it's also handy if you end up coming into camp late and you have to prepare dinner in the dark. It frees up your hands to cook, if nothing else. But anyway, it's getting late. We've hung the food away from the tent and made sure there's no no scraps left inside the tent since we're in bear country and we're gonna probably be getting up pretty early tomorrow so I think we'll call it a night Well, it got a little colder last night than we thought it was going to get, but the nice thing about it is that all this nice moisture in the air here in the Smokies creates this beautiful rime ice on the trees in the morning. So you wake up and have a nice hot cup of coffee waiting for you, which fortunately was there because the bears and other critters didn't get our food out of the tree last night. So we're just pretty much done here. We'll break the tent and then head on down. We'll see you next time on Trailside. Hey Al, you want to give me a hand with this tent? Sure. Grab those stakes back there and then we'll take the fly off. Al, I told you about these tent stakes now. There they are. 
I was gonna get them, don't worry. <laughs> It'll warm it up here pretty soon. Start taking some of these clothes off. Yeah, that'll be nice. I love that. Yeah, that is a problem. Funding for Trailside is made possible in part by Chevy Trucks, who reminds you that it's possible to have fun outdoors and still leave Mother Nature with a smile on her face, too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And High Tech Sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure. Doing one more. You wouldn't mind doing another one? Let's do the wild sound right now. Do this wild track right here. Rolling. Want me to be walking? 52, take two. We're fine. Got sound? We got everything? Yep. Hi, I'm John Veeman. Some of you may know me as the editor of Backpacker Magazine, but today I'd like to welcome you to a new show called Trailside. Our theme is Make Your Own Adventure, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Every week, we'll be somewhere in the outdoors, backpacking, cross-country skiing, canoeing, having a good time, and showing you how to do it, too. We'll see you soon on Trailside. Any better? I'll take from the top anytime. Hi, I'm John Veeman. This show Some has to be remembered yet, first because it was the amazing. Trailside pilot. Today, I'd like to welcome we you were to just sorting out the show. idea of what we wanted Trailside. to do for a new television Thanks, series. Uh, so you can just imagine how much discussion there was as we made our way up the trail to Campsite 13. Imagine being on the trail with the comforting, familiar feeling of a loaded pack on your back, your feet gently softening to your boots after weeks in street shoes, the brilliant fall colors jumping out of the Appalachian Hills, and here we are talking up a storm about a television show. Somewhere along that trail we saw the contradiction in what we were proposing of creating a show about the outdoors that if successful, would make more people turn on their television sets. It was pretty typical of our executive producer, Steve Samuels, to seize that notion, and on the spot he devised the advertising theme for the show. He envisioned a beautiful photo of the outdoors with a headline across the top announcing, at last, a television show that will ensure you watch less TV. Yeah. It was the only way any of us could really justify what we were about to undertake. Much as we were excited about sharing the outdoors experience with a whole new September. audience. And that advertising campaign is now a huge success, by the way. Smoke is really a fine mist of vapor. The Smoky Mountains show was not an especially easy show to make, especially when we were down in the valley. It was peak fall color, so the nation's most heavily visited national park was bursting at the seams with cars and tour buses. I never thought I'd see gridlock in a national park, but for an afternoon, we were stuck in it right there in Smoky Mountains National Park. And most of the scenes, like the one at John Oliver's cabin, took hours to complete, since hundreds of people were streaming through as the cameras tried to roll. It was nice to have the audience, but, you know, I really don't think I look a bit like David Letterman. Anytime. Other scenes in the show happened because of the crowds as well. We originally planned on shooting the scene with the ranger inside hey his cabin. Hey but with Good the constant you. traffic well, and people asking where to find the bathrooms and where can I get a drink of water, we quickly took our show yeah. back outside. And the hood well, of a park ranger's Gregory vehicle Ridge served our right needs just as well anyway. Okay, we're going Once we were up on the trail, away from the paved Careful, road, however, we leaves. hardly saw another person. And that's really the beauty of putting everything on your back and striking out down the trail. Only a small percentage of the crowds you hear about 
will ever go beyond the scenic overlooks along the roadways. when you work for it. So what are we going to do about storing food up here? Well, in most places, what we would do is bag the food and hang it from a tree so that a bear couldn't reach it. Uh -huh. But there are no suitable trees here, so we have to take extra precautions. We want to avoid is any foods with a strong odor. So I like to take pasta, rice, dried soups, also, there are dehydrated fruits and vegetables, like these red peppers. And put everything in a plastic bag. For instance, this oatmeal is placed in a plastic bag and sealed, then placed in a second plastic bag, which is also sealed. That is placed in a garbage bag, which I not, taking all the air out of the bag first, put it into a second garbage bag, which is also knotted, and that all is placed in a zipper duffel bag. So and then you just leave it right out on the beach? And I've never been bothered by bears. You use a poncho, huh? Yeah, it's much uh, cooler. I don't like to be sweating underneath my rain gear. I want as much ventilation as I possibly can. Huh. I kind of like to use these <coughs> pack covers because they, that way you can kind of take your pack off if you stop. and. Still have your rain suit on. I've noticed you've been spinning a lot faster than I am, Lou. Is there a reason for that? Well, yeah, actually, it's a lot more efficient uh, on your knees and aerobically to spin faster. Uh, one thing you should try to achieve is a cadence of about 70 to 90 beats per minute. Okay. Yeah, that feels a lot better now. All right, good. The only exception to that is occasionally uh, you want to stand up and get out of the saddle a little bit, in which case you'll drop a gear and, uh, and slow your cadence down a little bit, and that helps get you up off the saddle and stretch the back of your legs a little bit. Well, after you've set up camp, the next question a parent is bound to hear is, where do I go to the bathroom? And the answer is pretty straightforward. As soon as you hear that question, you want to be ready with your potty trowel and an extra plastic bag. And then you designate an area just off site of the camping area as the designated bathroom area. And the procedure is pretty simple. Just like with adults, you want to dig a little cat hole about six inches deep, have them do their business, then cover it back up and tamp lightly. And then just like anything else you pack into the woods, you want to pack your paper out in the plastic bag. These solo canoes really do give you a lot of independence. They're not that much different from paddling a tandem. Probably the only big difference is that it's a little trickier keeping yourself in a straight line. Now you can do what comes instinctively, which is basically sit there and switch paddle sides every other stroke. That can be a bit frustrating. What I'd much prefer to see you doing is a reversible C stroke. Now that's pretty much what it looks like. If you can imagine yourself drawing a backward C on the water, you got the hang of this stroke. I'm exaggerating a little bit here just to show you what it looks like, but once you get the hang of it, it's a very subtle movement.
Whatever you do, just keep thinking small. Put one, one arm out in front of you, and one arm behind you. Okay. You just push your pack and move slowly. Yeah. And to use your feet. Okay. Now we're lucky this time. We're going downhill, which is good news if we can get through, but real bad news if we can't. Okay, you're sure we can get through this one, Dave? Well, we'll find out real soon. These things are miserable. You also have to garden them, which is moving the rocks aside. Hi, I'm John Beeman. This week, the best backcountry trails are right outside our door. We're skiing the hut-to-hut system of Colorado's San Juan Mountains, 11,000 feet up on trail side. 